Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here with Bloody Falls of Copper Mine, uh, of the Copper Mine. Madness, Murder, and the Collision of Cultures in the Arctic, 1913, by McKay Jenkins, J-E-N-K-I-N-S, published in 2005. Perfect condition, beautiful book, beautiful binding, probably has never been read, certainly didn't, doesn't look like it has, no notes in it. A dollar at Strand, shameful. Um, I read this because I've been on a binge for um, books and information about the Arctic lately, which may have started with having watched Ice Road Truckers, I think maybe, I don't know, but I watched all those and, uh, and now have read several books about Alaska and Northern Canada and the Arctic and so on. And they're easy, fluffy books to read. I read them when I'm yawning and bored and tired of the other stuff that I'm reading. Uh, so, oh no, I apologize if my voice is flat with this microphone. I don't even know where the microphone is at on this computer. There's just this little green dot where the camera is, and I don't know. It's a Macintosh flat panel display thing. So, Anyways, on to some tidbits from Bloody Falls of the Copper Mine. Now this is a story, of, uh, not a story, it's a historical recounting of a couple of Eskimos who murdered a couple of priests clear up in Eskimo land. And uh, the Canadian Mounted Police went up there, arrested them, and brought them south for trial. And I don't recall what the sentence was, but I think that they gave them a suspended sentence and sent them back to their homeland and stuff. The first um, jury said they're not guilty. But uh, the judge let it be known that that was not going to fly in order to retrial. And the second time they convicted them, but uh, just sent them back to their, their village. Anyways, that's not really what we're going to get out of. We are being the philosophical historians that we are, we are going to get uh, some information out of it uh, obliquely or something like that. It talks about how the, the Eskimos created uh, soft um, leather by making clothes out of caribou hide. You may know that leather has to be softened with um, rotten stuff. Uh, a a leather tannery is a place with just about anything that will go rotten in water and then you dip the leather in the water or soak it in the water or whatever. Really putrid, rancid, just about anything that will go rotten. Um, and take the water from that, rub it on the leather, softens the leather. And I was wondering how would they do that up there in the cold where you just don't, there isn't that much stuff to make go rotten, and so on, and, and where would they keep it, and it's so cold, it would, you know, it's like living in a refrigerator up there, so stuff couldn't go rotten, and how would you have soft leather, and that's, they wear leather all the time, that's all they wear, is, is um, furs and stuff, well, it turns out that they rub brains on the hide, and that helps make it supple, and then in order to make it rain resistant, they smoke it, I would think it would be rain resistant already, but that's what it says here. That's on page 10. Now, the next bit um, is instructive for anyone who's not an atheist. People who believe that events have to have willpower behind them. The Native Americans were so damn stupid, they thought that there was a willpower pulling water downhill. It was the spirit of the stream which wanted the water to go downhill. And there's a willpower for the trees moving in the breeze. There's a willpower behind everything in nature, if you ask these people. Um, uh, monotheists, modern Christians, generally say there's only a willpower behind a limited number of things, namely the creation of the universe, the creation of man, and so on. So it's, it's a primitive anthropogenic belief that there's a willpower behind things. Actually, things can just be. They can just happen. They can simply exist. They don't have to have a willpower behind them. Um, but it's very difficult for us to imagine that. I mean, still, when something goes bump in the night, you think that there's a willpower, there's an entity, 
something's made it happen. It couldn't just be the broom finally fell over or something, vibration, leaning on the fridge and the broom falls over. You immediately think there's a willpower, there's somebody doing something. So it's obvious, it's a way of thinking. Well, the Eskimos thought that unless you kill animals correctly and with what they consider moral ways of doing it, you'll piss off the animals. And they believed that starvation was a result of the willpower of animals. It couldn't just be an event, it couldn't just be an unfortunate situation. It's from the willpower of the animals. Uh, it talks about this guy, Braynet, and he saw the Eskimos kill, um, what is it, a caribou. With his newfound admiration for native hunting skills, Braynat decided soon afterwards to try his own hand at bringing down a caribou. Armed with an old carbine, now this is one of the, um, one of the uh, priests that en ends up getting murdered. Armed with an old carbine, he managed to shoot an animal, but his prey did not die. It lay where it fell, quivering. Rather than spend another precious cartridge, he smashed the butt of his rifle into the caribou's skull, killing it instantly. But now he had no knife or axe to dress the kill. Instead, he undid the girdle on his black cassock, tied it around the caribou's neck, and dragged it to the top of a nearby woodpile. Now, that doesn't sound too bad to me. I mean, shot it. It wants to save ammunition. Ammunition's very, very precious and expensive. Um, everywhere. I mean, back then it was so expensive, it had to be made by hand and stuff. And uh, so it's much more expensive compared to the cost of it now. And in addition, they're way up in the Arctic. They can't get uh, resupplied with ammunition that easily. So it's not that bad to hit the thing on the head and kill it. Word quickly spread among the Indians. They were horrified at the blundering indignity of the kill. Brainat had disregarded rituals of respect for prey animals that hunters had long held dear. His actions might, at the spirit level, cause the caribou to let the people starve. It was a major scandal among the whole population, Brainat wrote. The spirit of the caribou thus struck would go and tell all the rest of its race. These would never come back. Very shortly, there would be complete famine. An utter disaster. So the caribou would go and say, I was killed in an ignominious and improper way. Don't go near those Eskimos. Anthropomorphism. They have to have a willpower behind everything. Uh, now we skip a page and a half, or one page later. The Eskimo religion consisted primarily of prohibitions and taboos. They did not have a sophisticated um, philosophy of the world. They were like overgrown children, it was said, said in this book right here by people. Of course, that's not a politically correct view today. Today, politically correct view is that they are more brilliant than industrialized man, that they live in conjunction with their environment and their, I mean, Nowadays, all the Eskimos just live in, in little Western-style homes and live on welfare checks. But a hundred years ago, when they were still hunting and still living in igloos, they were still in touch with their environment or whatever, uh, they, that view of them is held to be superior to industrial man. But anyways, uh, but the prohibitions of Christianity were easy for them to understand. You tell them about uh, the great sophistication of your religion and the philosophical depth and, the, and everything, uh, they didn't think too much of that. They just wanted the practical, you know, tell me what I need to do or not do to make this God that you are involved with happy or unhappy. That was their attitude. Uh, so the taboos of Christianity seemed reasonable to Eskimos. Here are a few things that the Eskimos uh, believed. They believed that sickness, famine, and death were caused by the breaking of a marrow bone with the wrong kind of hammer, or the sewing of deerskin clothing before enough days had elapsed from the killing of the last whale or walrus. So you kill a whale or a walrus, and you have to wait a certain number of days before you can sew deerskins together. 
To avoid breaking these taboos meant prosperity and good health. Adding notions of sin and salvation seemed perfectly logical. So they already had these views that you can't do this or that silly little petty thing. So why not add things in like uh, you can't uh, touch your private parts and you have to be married, you can only have one spouse, uh, you can't steal, you can't kill. Why not add a few things? Now, uh, they were told about the prohibition against working on the Sabbath, and this had some strange results. Page 13 here. Around Christmas time in 1908, an Eskimo couple came to this camp and said, we've had a disaster. Um, they left another couple, including the man's sister, behind at a camp, uh, their dogs had already died of starvation, so this is they're going out for a rescue party to come back and get the other two. Uh, so the Eskimos put together a, a group, and they're about to head out, and someone points out, today's Sunday, we can't begin any, jour any journeys today. So they waited till midnight. Uh, and They waited till after midnight, then they finally set out, quote, a fair day had turned foul with snow blowing into great drifts that covered any sign of the sled trail. The search party had no luck. They couldn't find what they were looking for. Later that evening, the man of the abandoned couple turned up, barely alive. So there's a man and a woman still left behind. The man turned up at a cabin three miles north of the Cape of Smythe and Cabin. A second search party went out immediately and found his wife, a half-day's journey away, sitting beside a dead fire, her hands and feet completely frozen. Now, uh, this Eskimo, a strong, strapping man who made it survive with everything intact, uh, was a Christian and knew about Christianity and so on. So, this Stephenson, I think it's one of the two fathers, maybe not, this Canadian guy asks the, the guy, asks the man, you've known Christianity for ten years, you know more prayers than any other Eskimo, uh, you're very careful not to break Christian commandments, you don't work on Sundays, you don't eat a meal without saying grace. Um, quote, I asked him whether he had ever heard that such things as leaving his sister to starve to death were also against the law of the Lord. Not his sister, I think, but his wife. And he replied that he had heard he had not heard anything about that. So it didn't it's not Christianity the philosophy of the value of people didn't sink into them. It was uh, a practical way for you to survive better, get to the afterlife better, etc. Um, not there's no no such view of the value of every human life or anything like that. It doesn't quite sink into the Eskimos, even though Christianity does have that view of the value of every human life because of its inheritance of Greek philosophy. But the Eskimos didn't grasp it on that level. They grasped it as a set of taboos, a set of do this, don't do this. Uh, so there we are. That's the end of chapter one. Chapter 2 starts out with a quote from Will Durant, Our Oriental Heritage, his book, Our Oriental Heritage. Of what are you thinking? Perry asked one of his Eskimo guides. The Eskimo guide answered, I do not have to think. I have plenty of meat. So uh, you only think when you are hungry or need to, to get food or shelter or clothing. Other than that, you don't think. Shut your mind down, not worry. Now, for people who believe that religion is something that comforts us and makes us feel better, for example, Ricky Gervais in his movie The Art of Lying, religion was invented to make us feel okay about death. I quote now from page 43, chapter 3, The religious doctrines of the Eskimos brought them little or no comfort. Life would be hard enough if they had none but natural forces to contend with, forces they could see and estimate. But mysterious and hostile powers, invisible and incalculable, and therefore potentially all the more dangerous, hem them in, as they believe, on every side. So they never know from day to day whether a fatal sickness will not strike them down or a sudden misfortune overwhelm them and their families. From no apparent cause, it may be, and for no conceivable reason, 
save the ill will of the, un, of the unseen foes. Now, there was a poem by a, um, a Roman, I think, uh, a long poem. Let's see, was it by Lucretius? Anyways, this poem went on uh, about how we don't have to worry anymore about uh, being at constant threat from the sky and from all the things around us, because now we understand that it's all just nature. Um, he said, you know, in the past there were ignorant peoples and they were constantly threatened by all these things they didn't understand, but now we've grown out of that. We've come past that. That's what religion is. It's just a bunch of hocus-pocus and nonsense. And uh, getting past it allows you to see life for what it is. Maybe life on this little blue dot, this pale blue dot, uh, isn't perfect and brilliant, but it's also not subject to the willpower of some capricious spirits or gods. We are just here by ourselves on this mode of dust, and we've got to figure it out for ourselves. Oh, all right. Enough about uh, the religion. Then. Since shades controlled everything from the weather to the migration patterns of caribou, Eskimos had created rituals to appease them. Neglecting these rituals could bring about catastrophe. Whenever a hunter killed a caribou or a seal, a scrap of the organs or a piece of the blubber had to be thrown to the spirits. Products of land and sea were never to be cooked in the same pot at the same time, though they could be eaten in the same meal. Products of the land and the sea had to be cooked separately, uh, but could be eaten together. Anytime an Eskimo traded an animal skin to a white man, he had to cut off a small piece and keep it, Otherwise, all animals would leave the country. <laughs> that would piss the animals off, to have the white man take all of their skins away in boats or whatever. Yeah. What a weird idea, huh? As a rule, animals were considered far wiser than men. Isn't that a disgusting culture? to believe that animals are wiser than humans. Animals knew everything, including the thoughts of men. But there were certain things animals needed that they could not provide for themselves. Seals, for example, needed fresh water to drink. But since they lived in salt water, they had no way to get it. So the seals would allow themselves to be killed in exchange for a dipper full of fresh water from the hunter. If a seal was killed, killed and not offered water, all other seals would hear of it, and no smart seal would ever allow itself to be killed by that hunter. What a strange idea. Why do they allow themselves to be killed by us? Oh, because they're thirsty. Likewise, polar bears in the afterlife desired tools like crooked knives and bow drills. Since a bear's soul remained with it for four or five days after death, I guess that's something that they tested and knew to be true, hunters would hang these tools beside a drying skin inside their snow house. When the bear's soul was finally driven from the house, it would take the souls of the tools with it. Of course, the tools remained behind, but the souls of the tools went with it. And I'll bet that those tools could be used again in a like manner providing yet more souls of more tools for more bears. Who knows, though? If malevolent spirits seemed capricious in their visitations, they could also be conjured and driven off by shamans who knew incantations handed down from men of the first times. Uh, pause there for a minute and uh, consideration of, of um, the Greek attitude. The Greeks thought that spirits and gods and ghosts were capricious, malevolent, much like the Eskimos did. Uh, but the, the Greeks thought that the spirits and ghosts and gods were all kind of stupid and lacked justice. Now, just about every culture in history looked at the sorrows and difficulties of life and came up with malevolent spirits to explain these, uh, including the Greeks. But no other culture besides the Greeks 
came to the conclusion that man is therefore better than the gods and the spirits. Only the Greeks came to that conclusion. And as it says here, the Eskimos even thought animals were smarter than humans. It's just a shame. Now it talks about shamans and the power that the shamans have. Shamans could enter a trance during which they were possessed by a familiar or spirit guide who would give the shaman access to the spirit world. Once possessed, shamans could perform extraordinary acts. They could swallow fire, fly through the air, change into animals, sink into the ground or the water, kill and restore to life. In previous times, get this, in previous times they had been able to visit the moon, but recently had lost that power. Yes, of course. Now, bizarrely, oddly, uh, shamans wore no distinguishing clothes, even when they were performing seances. They could buy, be either men or women, and they came, so this is an egalitarian society, and came to their powers not through appointment, but by performance. Although they had a power that other people did not possess, they were not afforded sanctity or social status. They must have had some social status, huh? Uh, shamans more closely resembled physicians than priests, and they gave their services free for any public cause. Uh, well, it's doubtful that whether they were more familiar, similar to physicians than priests. Uh, but an interesting point here, uh, if they came to their powers uh, not through appointment by performance, but by performance, then it's an interesting uh, it's interesting to think how they came to their powers, because we know now with retrospect they really didn't have any powers. It mentions a, a shaman lady who turned into a wolf in order to uh, make the caribou hunt better or something like that. And she made a bunch of thrashing noises and put her head down underneath uh, some stuff. And, and then she raised her head up and she had two big wolf canines in her mouth and she went... Rawr! and then went back down and took him out of her mouth. And everybody in the igloo swore that she had turned into a wolf. Uh, now, trickery and nonsense uh, and magicians' tricks like that are how the shamans raised themselves to the position. And these were the most sophisticated people in the culture. Now, once in a while, there must have been an individual born who was individualistic. Uh, and can you imagine the suffocation of living in a culture like that, where the smartest people were um, you just known for playing the silliest little magician's tricks and stuff? Just bizarre. Now, uh, about this lady who had put the wolf teeth in and stuff. She uttered a few broken words in a feeble, barely audible falsetto, the audience leaning forward to catch every nuance. Two minutes later... It was all over. Higilak cried again as her familiar left her. Higilak is the uh, shaman. Uh, so as the familiar left her, she cried and then gasped. At last, the seance was over. Cl close to collapse from exhaustion, Higilak claimed to be ignorant of what had just transpired and had to ask others in the, in the tent what she had said. So there's a, a good trick. When you wake up from it, say... Whoa, what happened? And credulous people will believe that you weren't there, even though you're the one who said the stuff. Uh, everyone agreed, without the slightest reservation, that Higalak had not been acting. She had been transformed into a wolf. <laughs> now from page 48. To a critical and unsympathetic outsider, such as Mr. Cropper, it may seem that a seance of this type is simply a case of palpable fraud on the part of the shaman, and of almost unbelievable stupidity and credulity on the part of the audience. And this is Genis, one of the priests, writing about it. A little amateurish ventriloquism, a feeble attempt at impersonation, trying to impersonate a wolf, all performed in full daylight before an audience incapable of distinguishing between fact and fancy, between things, between seen things and things imagined, 
or at least so mentally unbalanced that it reacted to the slightest suggestion and hypnotized itself into believing the most impossible things. That, perhaps, is all there may be seen to be in Eskimo shamanism. I think so. I think that's about it. Now, the author says, Strangely, shamans often considered the god described by missionaries as a new spirit, not a false one. The Christian god seemed to be connected to a glorious life after death. Add him to the mix, the shaman seemed to say. The Eskimo religion was a religion of life. The missionary's religion was a religion of death. That's Christianity for you. We have to follow Inu ways to, in order to get our food here in, on our land and to live, one man said. But we have to follow the Christians in order to get into heaven when we die. So we need both. We need our practical taboos for living on earth, and we need the Christian taboos so we can get into heaven. Uh, now, uh, I'll note, as I often have in videos of the past, that it is always the, not in, in this series particularly, but it is always the more sophisticated culture which flows into and affects the unsophisticated or less sophisticated or more primitive culture. And we certainly see that here. Nothing from the Eskimos' culture flowed into the white man's, well, I don't know, knowledge of igloos and stuff, maybe. But white man's culture sure did affect the, the shamanistic credul credulity of uh, the, the Inuit or the Eskimos. I think Inuit and Eskimos are separate. The Inuit are a different group of different language, but they're all up there in the north. You know. Now, an interesting fact, we're on page 64, about the Eskimos' language. Uh, one of the priests was named LaRue, L-E-R-O-U-X. LaRue's difficulties with the language were hardly surprising. For one thing, the Eskimos had a daily vocabulary extending to some 10,000 words, four times that of Europeans. Human speech has 140 separate pieces of sound. Norwegians use 60. Eskimos use 50. English speakers use 40. The possibilities for error were rife. In one dialect, the word utuk means a seal sleeping on ice, ujuk is a bearded seal, ujuk with just one j instead of two is soup, uksuk is the fat of sea animals, utsuk is a vagina, and usuk is a penis. English speakers use four forms of a noun, man, mans, men, mens. The Greeks used 14. The Eskimos used 27. The Eskimo language had evolved to a precision that astonished its first Western listeners and vividly reflected the subtle relationships that they had with the land. Now, I pause for a minute there. It's not necessarily, we shouldn't necessarily call it sophisticated. We might call it um, a burdensome, messy, uh, oversized. The thing is, when you start writing things down and making rules for things, you can eliminate um, redundancies and uh, things that aren't necessary and simplify the language. And this is why ancient Greek is such a difficult language to learn, because it is basically a language that came out of the wild, and that's why they had so much, uh, you know, it was an unwritten language at first, and then they began writing it down. Later on, languages that developed didn't have that many vagaries about them, and they were written languages right off the bat, so you have a different situation. Now, uh, about the Eskimos and all the words that they had, what did they use all these words for? There was no direct translation for fish, but there were distinct words for Arctic char, depending on whether the speaker meant Arctic char that were running upstream, Arctic char that were moving down to the sea, or Arctic char that remained all year in the lake. So, instead of... This is, this is sort of like... Um, there are a lot of uh, things that need to be named and talked about in, in a given context, and 
for, for Europeans, um, we wouldn't just have one single word for uh, having ideas or thinking or contemplating, right? Because it depends on what you're thinking or contemplating about. If it's thinking or contemplating about something that's not true, like a, just a fantasy, you might be daydreaming. If it's thinking or contemplating about the truth or falsehood of a scientific view, you might be uh, said to be investigating or, or studying or whatever. We have many, many different words for the context in how you think and what you think about and so on. The Eskimos, of course, didn't have any use for that. We had one word for fish. Then you can name different types of fish. They couldn't get along by just saying fish. They had to have all the... So you see, it's the context of the language. Uh, our language needs multiple words for thinking. What are you thinking about and why? And we've got dozens of words for that, compared to the Eskimos who have dozens of words for different types of fish, but no particular word just for fish itself. So, interesting point about language there. Um, uh, for Arctic natives, precision was a matter of survival. What astonished the Eskimos, of course, was how strangers could expect to survive in this country without such language. The answer for quite a few of them was that they couldn't. A lot of people just died, but the Eskimos were astonished that white man comes and doesn't know anything about anything up here. They thought of white men as absolutely helpless, which they were, and a lot of white men died up there. 